I took some of my models down to a place called the Hollywood Book and Poster Company in Hollywood. It's still there. It's, it was at a different location, but I asked if I could leave this stuff in the um, window to see if I could generate any any interest in doing models because I thought ILM, which was around then, was a super secret place. And later I found out it was in the phone book, but uh, I didn't even put that together at the time. Well, actually, the first uh, film work we were doing, the first miniatures were done when we were kids. And when I say we, it's my brother Dennis and I. Kind of got to know people. Uh, there was a, a fellow by the name of Bob Burns, uh, who was a, a, a big uh, sci-fi fan, had a science fiction magazine, uh, monster magazine that we grew up with, and uh, went over to his house and met a lot of people like Dennis Murin and uh, Doug Beswick and uh, Tom Sherman. You know, it's just one of those things that networking just uh, started happening because of mutual interests. So I got I got a job on a low budget movie that the the original the co owner of, of Hollywood Book and Poster, Steve Barquette, was doing a movie called The Aftermath, and he needed a production assistant and just a gopher. And I and I I said yes, I'll do that. And I met uh, Robert Skotak, and and it was one of his first things here. He was doing the visual effects, and this was a very low budget movie. But we were, you know, I was working with, this, with Bob before his brother Denny came out. Denny came out like a few months later. And they were doing in-camera camera effects, and I was learning all the in-camera stuff. So built a spaceship. We the model was about a couple feet long, and it was uh, eventually, you know, we shot it in his apartment, <laughs> Bob's apartment. And uh, I was at a party. And uh, there was a fellow there who was making a film, and he was looking for somebody who could do visual effects or special effects. We called them then. We didn't use the term visual effects. And before I could stop myself, I said, oh, I do that. It was a little film called The Aftermath. Wound up spending uh, maybe uh, two years working <laughs> on that film. It became a career. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, my brother uh, became the DP on the film, and I was the camera assistant. When we came to the, the era that I started in post-Star Wars, it was just people that were doing miniatures, that's all they did. And they did them extremely well, so they, they had sort of a focus group of talent that would come in. So the quality, and these guys did great stuff for the studios, but this was, was I think, a whole different approach to, to building the things. We brought in as many high-tech materials as, as we could, you know, epoxies, new, new types of plastics and new methods of doing things etched brass, you know, doing photo etched brass and, and uh, you know, ultimate laser cutting and all the stuff to speed up the process. So, so the, the quality took a big jump up, you know, and especially the optical quality of putting the shots together optically, the miniature photography, you know, the lighting and, and all these things. And uh, because we had more money and more time, the quality went up. Worked in Firefox and did a lot of painting. I painted the Firefox and uh, Doug Smith was trying to figure out ways that we could take the shiny model and put it from a blue screen by shooting multiple passes, different colors, putting different color lights on it. And I was taking Frisca paper and spraying it flat black and trying to do a second pass where we were putting this bl flat black paper on the model and it was just wasn't working. And in the meantime, John Erland had been working on a, a new process where he was sort of the uh, science guy at this point. He was building the, the pylons, the blue pylons that would hold the models so they would match with the background blue. It was actually a, a, the, the motorized thing that held the model. So John was doing that stuff, but he came up with this interesting process where uh, he would take a, a phosphor and mix it with a clear paint and spray it on the model. And he wasn't great at painting and he asked me if I could help, help him in the evenings. So I said, sure. And so the idea was that the model would be sprayed with this paint that under normal house lights you wouldn't see it glow and you would shoot it against black. So you do what's called the production pass, which is the nice, beautiful lighting pass. And you do that first and then you would turn those lights off in and bring black lights in, those fluorescent black lights, do the same pass because the, the computer could repeat the, the move exactly the same and the model would now glow blue against black, and that way you could generate a mat. And you didn't have to worry about the blue screen falling onto the model because you weren't using a blue screen. 
So I would get this stuff that Erlen, this concoction, I would mix it with clear lacquers and paint it and get it to the point where it wasn't fluorescing under normal light. Because that was the problem when he first gave it to me, was you could still see this bluish tone under normal uh, uh, production lights. So John gives, Erlen gives uh, Dykstra this wing, and he says, yeah, that looks good and everything. And John goes, Erlen goes, well, look at this. Turns the black lights on, the whole thing glows blue. And so Dykstra sees that and says, okay, let's go with this because he knew instantly that that was the only way to get the, the sheer volume of these shots done. I eventually used a, a, a floor wax, future floor wax, which you could paint on. It was shiny, and you could take off with ammonia, like household ammonia. And Erlen got a water-based version of this, of this phosphor, and I mixed, and it actually worked. It looks a little candy coating, but uh, we could actually... I could actually take the stuff off when it started losing its, its the oomph out of the phosphors, and uh, it was all experimental. It was all just we we're just like trying to figure it out going through. But I worked on lots of stuff, and it was a fun project. And uh, and so I uh, so we at least in the big budget, we always had a fair amount of time and a fair amount of money to do it right, which we all love doing it, and we all enjoy doing it. But sort of the late '80s, early '90s, the 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 um, budgets got a lot tighter and, and, and things had to be done a little faster and not quite as good as you'd hoped. But then in contrast, the, the lower budget stuff, um, because the, we didn't have the money to do it, if you could make it look pretty good, they were really happy. It's probably more than they expected to get, being, they being the producers. So when I worked at Rogers, you know, at Corman's, it was a pretty low budget place. Um, they were getting pretty good work for not that much money. But what they were allowing the model makers to do was to, to design a lot of this. The Skotak brothers were, were sort of designing the ships and building them. So what you didn't have was a director coming in and changing things and redoing things and so forth, where when you have more money, the director has a lot of power to redo things and make it their exact way. When you have less money, um, I think you're happy if somebody comes up with a great design. You just don't have the money to go back and change it endlessly. And so the the model makers were totally capable of designing great looking ships, which they did, and and built them and lit them and shot them and and so they so there was actually a little more autonomy in the visual effects side than there is, you know, with with the bigger bu budget movies. You could actually. Be a little more creative, and and they were like again, they were really happy to see great looking stuff. Uh, both Robert and, and Denny were were building miniatures originally, and then eventually shooting a lot of the when, when they got the whole place going, they were shooting the shots. You know, they were doing you know all their in camera magic stuff that they're so good at. You know, the the more money you have, the more uh, control you have, but the more control someone else has, and that's sort of the. And I go through it with with supervising. You know, I'm I'm. You know, I work for a director or the studio, and, and we'll do something, show them drawings and do it, and they go, well, it's not quite what we want. You know, we have to go back and redo it, and then someone else will see it. They have the studio, no, no, that's not what I want. So, you know, things get changed, and, and it costs more money, and it just that's just the process when you have more money. Sometimes in the evening, Bob and Denny would come and help detail stuff on the Sulaco. So uh, then I painted it, and... And, uh, and I was pretty happy with that model. It came out pretty nicely. And I think Sid Mead had told me a long time ago he was, he was happy with the look of it. Because, you know, a lot of times his design wouldn't necessarily be followed completely accurately to, to the finished product. Some stuff would be changed or modified. The director might change something. So, so we tried to stay as close as we could to his design. I still like the model stuff. I think if I could just go back to making one thing at my desk... I probably would be happy, but uh, anything more sort of overseeing it is is not a you know it's it's stressful because it's you know at, at that point the money is the responsibility of the, of the cost is on your shoulders and you have to deliver. But unfortunately, I, I I can't really draw, but I can I can very plainly see something in my mind's eye. I can absolutely see it. I can when I was bidding, I would close my eyes and look at something. And say, okay, I got to build. We got to account for this. You know, like in Apollo 13, I would look at lunar module, and the, they call it the stack and the command service module thing. They're going to make that that engine bell, the, the cylinder, the bleh, this and that, this and that. So I just close my eyes and look at it, and then write down what I needed to do. 
It's interesting the, th the relationship between creativity and budget and what's possible. You know, there's all kinds of ways that formula can work. Uh, you can have very little money uh, and have a lot to do and then have an environment, a director, a situation set up where you're empowered to do it the most economical way possible, meaning you work it out with the director and you find uh, that you can actually do a lot more with very little money than say a very, very specific thing uh, done with a, a lot of money <laughs> on a bigger film where the, the needs are so specific and there's no flexibility whatsoever and there's a lot of um, visitors who want to see, inspect the models and look at them close up so you, you build them a lot better than, you, than is necessary for the screen. So you actually wind up doing less sometimes in those situations because it's, uh, it, it's what's dictated by the situation. So it isn't necessarily only what's possible with the money and the ambition level. It's also what, how creatively you, you, what your creative input is, how you design the shots, how you can steer the shots. If you can pre-plan and stick to that plan, that's where you, you always maximize the budget. Uh, it's when there's sudden surprises and changes, last minute changes, or there's an equivocating about what the shot should be that you have to overbuild. And this goes for digital, it goes for any, any kind of effect, for any, anything that has to be made for a movie. If something's going to be seen from far away, it might not cost very much, but if it's going to suddenly, maybe, somebody will say we might want to do some close-ups of it, suddenly it costs ten times as much. So that's the planning and the decision making and, and and that decides where the money is going to go and how it's going to use and how efficiently it's used. I enjoyed both of them. They were both a lot of fun. And uh, in a way, the low budget stuff was more fun because we got to do more of it. It more came from you know, our creative centers you know, than larger budget stuff.